what will happen if machines uh, replaces people and human? So this is the question we're going to try and answer tonight. In Aginawani, I'm Shafuzan Johari. I'm very um, happy to have uh, Mr. Neil Cross. He is the Chief Innovation Officer uh, from the world's best digital bank, DBS Singapore. Welcome. Right. Thank Indonesia. you. It's a, it's a great honor. I'm really enjoying honor myself mine. up here in, in uh, Kuala Lumpur at the moment. So um, you're here for the um, Kazana Megatrend Forum. That's uh, right. It was you, what you've said was uh, for me is awesome, and uh, you talk about um, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of um, uh, pessimism in the industry. People are afraid that uh, there will be a lot of peop uh, people without jobs once the machine takes over. Uh, you're from the best bank in the world. I mean, the most, uh, yeah, the best digital bank in the world. Uh, uh, you, you, there's a lot. I, I, I would somehow rather uh, imagine that uh, there will be more tellers in your bank and those will be replaced by machine. So how do you deal with them? How do you deal with, you know, uh, retraining your people, uh, getting them up to par with the certain standard of the, the new standard of industry? Can you tell us more? Yeah, I mean, the, we, you know, we know that the world's changing on many different axes. Uh, the artificial intelligence, the robotics, you know, is one. Um, also, the way that companies are constructed is rapidly changing as well. I mean, some would say in the future, actually, um, companies may just have literally one employee. And that's not so much just from AI and digitization. It's more as, um, you know, companies create their IP and they think more like an ecosystem player, so more like a Google mm. or a Facebook or an Amazon. You don't need to own, you know, everything you do. So at DBS Bank, we own our branches, we own our staff, we own our, you know, HR, our accounting. We pretty much own, and most companies own all their infrastructure, all their staff base. But then you look at companies like Uber, who don't own any cars. I think they've got a laptop under a desk somewhere. And, and maybe, you know, that's about it. And so their staff base are quite small, but obviously the revenues are, are huge. And the new world we live in with the advances in technology um, means that we can construct companies and grow very bigly, with, very big, without huge amounts of staff and technology. So that, that's a big thing that's happening at the same time as well. You know, as a bank, we have a lot of, and most companies have a lot of uh, people working in operations. Mm -hmm. And for me, operations, you could view it as um, they're there because a computer couldn't do something. So a good example is, you know, when a customer fills out a paper form, it means that they couldn't type directly into a computer. So whether that is a phone, whether mm -hmm. that's online. Mm -hmm. And so an operations person has to take that piece of paper, has to go key in that data into mm -hmm. the computer systems at the bank. So, so then there's lots of roles based around you know, that. But what we're seeing with artificial intelligence and a term called robotic process optimization mm. is actually now a lot of those you know, requirements, the connections between clients and the servers. The human touch. That's it, the human, that, that kind of operations mm. role is declining. And so all companies' operations teams will be declining. That's really going to be the first major impact mm. in this world of artificial intelligence. Yeah. So from, from workers' point of view, I'm kind of afraid uh, it, I, might lose, I, I might lose my job. Well, that is a common concern we get. Um, my view is, is, you know, operations people serve, have historically served, you know, uh, an amazing role inside an organization, yeah. Mm. And uh, the short-sighted companies, when, they, when those operations teams start to get smaller, will think, great, we can make more profit. You know, we can have lower overheads, etc. The more long-term and smarter companies like DBS are thinking, that's great, we can take those people we can repurpose them in the organization and we mm. can use them on more profitable tasks. We can use them to generate more money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that you uh, will you know, drastically slash your staff mm. base. It may mean actually that you're um, moving mm. a lot of those headcount into different areas of the organization to help you innovate. That requires well. different skill sets. That's right, yeah. So we at DBS, we have a number of programs um, based around entrepreneurship and we have a number of programs where we're teaching um, staff to be digitally savvy. So mm. teaching them things like data science, we're teaching them 
things like Lean Startup. We even pay staff to set up their own startup company. It's actually a staff benefit at DBS. So if someone wants to be an entrepreneur, we want to support them in that journey. And we give them money, we give them guidance, and we put them in a program where hopefully they can be the next billionaire and bank with DBS. Awesome, awesome. Because yeah. uh, there's, there's a lot of um, businesses in banks or rather operation in banks which aren't uh, really uh, been focused by the public. Uh, for instance, corporate banking. Mm. Those people behind corporate banking, they are still, you know, needs to actually make decision, human-based decision. Uh, these are the kind of things that, that needs improvement and uh, with the kind of training that you're uh, providing, that might help. As well, yeah. I mean, certainly, you, you know, I do a lot of work with universities because I'm uh, frustrated with the education system. I think it's... You do you? Yeah, I think it's just too heavily focused on... Um, teaching people information and not teaching them skills. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a program called Unicorn where we, we put a shout out to all the universities in a country. We've, we've done this in Taiwan, China, Singapore. Mm -hmm. And we ask them to send us a 30 second video on how they're going to reinvent the world. Mm -hmm. And what we do, we, we put them through a process of a hackathon style where they you know come up with inventions. Mm -hmm. And we take the best 20 and we bring them in the bank, we teach them to be entrepreneurs, and we get students focused on the bank's biggest problems. Mm. They engage with the senior leaders, and at the end of three months, they have to pitch the executives. Mm. So we've got the program, because I feel actually that we want to teach them toolkits. And so if we can teach um, staff and students and everyone we work with things like um, sales techniques, how mm. to sell, you mm. know, how to have presence, mm. how mm. to present, mm -hmm how to do mm -hmm. a business plan, mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. how to do data mm -hmm. analytics. Mm -hmm. And so I think mm -hmm. these are much more valuable in this new world, which mm -hmm. is fast moving, mm -hmm. where you're asked to do you know, different roles. Mm -hmm. You can't spend a huge amount of time mm -hmm. you know, fully understanding that thing mm -hmm. before you do it. But if you've got a mental toolkit where you can mm -hmm. solve any problem mm -hmm. and you can convince stakeholders to work with you, mm -hmm. I think this is the, the world we're moving to. Okay, we're going to take our first break and when we, when we come back, we talk about disruption and how to manage disruption uh, from organizational point of view. Don't go away, be right back. Welcome back to Again Now and I'm still with the Chief Innovation Officer of uh, DBS Bank and uh, Neil Cross is the, world most, the world's most disruptive CIO, CTO and that was awarded by Sir Richard Branson and Steve Fosniak. Congratulations. And, and Thank it was you. very recent. Uh, this was actually last year, right. Right, but fairly recent. It's the first award I've won. Uh -huh. um, so it's always nice to win an award from billionaires. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, you know, it feels different. You from get money too? <laughs> yeah. I didn't. I, I, uh, but what I did do, I, I, I get to spend. I got to spend quite a lot of time with Steve Wozniak, mm. which, um, as a technologist from a very young age, I used mm. to write computer games when I was eleven. Um, you know, he's obviously one of my heroes, and do you know what? He's one of the nicest people I've ever met, and so that was that was a wonderful experience. All right. So, so you're an icon of disruption. You see, <laughs> world's icon of disruption. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and and understanding disruption, I I'll say coming coming on pro, uh, from customers' point of view, consumers' point of view, you see Uber dis disrupt the whole taxi industry, Airbnb disrupt the whole um, uh, um, hotel industry, uh, and and you see there's a lot of coming from journalistic point of view, there's a lot of stories. You see there's a lot of angry people. And sometimes you can contain it, sometimes you can't. Mm. So from organizational point of view, how do you manage people expectation and trying to get them, you know, rally behind us? Well, that's the thing. You, if you look at, you know, startups are, uh, you know, they're very agile, they're very quick, they've got great talent and everyone's really excited and tend to be very, very, you know, young in most cases. And then you've got these legacy organizations where these current big businesses been successful for decades, know how to make money, hire lots and lots of people and add a lot of value back into the community, mm -hmm. um, which I think is important as well. And, but the, the smarter businesses really need to think about how can they act like a startup as well. Our CEO, Piyush, has got this term that we're a 22,000 person startup. 
Um, we're actually at 25,000 people now. And so we want to instill the best of the uh, startup mindset mm -hmm. into our, our staff base. And you can only do that through just mass programs of engagement. Um, so we do, um, we take, every year we'll, we'll have about 15,000 staff, um, which is well over half our staff base, come through our innovation facility and they'll be paired up with startups, with students, with industry partners, with customers, um, or different teams in the bank, and they have to operate like a startup. It's mandated at the bank that every single manager and director must reinvent part of their business. So if you're in HR, you must reinvent part of HR to get your bonus. If you're in the cards business, you have to reinvent the cards business. So it's both internal facing roles and external mm. roles as well. Mm. What we want to do is disrupt ourselves. We want to mm. test those assumptions. Mm. We've made assumptions about our business. Mm. Maybe it was made 10 years ago, mm. 20 years ago, mm. about how we should operate. Mm. We want to retest them, disrupt ourselves. If we disrupt ourselves, it's harder for someone else to do it to us. So you test it against yourself. That's right. But, but the key is to, to get your people to act as uh, startups. Yeah. Startup founders, you mean? That's right. We want, well, we want to operate like a startup. So basically to create small experiments. Every year at DBS, we run over a thousand experiments across the bank. And mm. it's, the, it's not the innovation group, it's the staff doing that. Mm. So creating little paper prototypes, walking into the street and testing them with customers. Wow. Yeah. wow. yeah, just like a startup does, just like Airbnb started, just like Facebook and others, we want to operate in that way. Now, the biggest issue I have is obviously around culture and mm. a lot of that is self-belief which is oh, I can't be a startup I, I can't be an yeah, innovator. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. That's the biggest and I see that actually when I talk to governments and I talk to corporates and I talk to staff and startups even then that's that seems to be the biggest thing that people have this self-limitation mm. and so we've got to break through that and also it's scary so one minute they're a banker yeah, and they've done very well at that. We've got some amazing bank bankers in DBS. And the next thing we're saying, actually, um, what we need you to do is be a startup now. And they're like, oh, oh, I don't know how to be a startup. And yeah. so you've got to create a safe place for them where they can experiment you know, on their journey to being mm. a startup. And mm. that's really, really important. And we've got to let people fail. Exactly. The key to, fa the key to startups is that you allow them to fail. That's right. But not and fail with customer data, <laughs> not fail with customers' money. So you have to do it in a, in a contained and safe way because uh -huh. um, obviously we're a bank, uh -huh. but we have to let them fail. And, and there is... And not be judged. And not, well, that's it. Or, you know, not get their bonus. So there's a difference exactly. between failure because you were ambitious and you tried something cool and failure because you're just bad at your job. Mm. And so we actually changed our reward structure at DBS Bank, our yearly awards, and we've got titles like Most Ambitious Failure, you Whoa. know, Biggest Experiment. Seriously? Yeah, yeah. Now, I'm not saying that everyone in the bank is Thank accepting <laughs> of failure, but it's it, changing, well, dri driving a cultural tra transformation like we're up to, it's a long journey. Well, coming from, uh, to, or to uh, understanding the context of Singapore, the kiasunas of the people and awarding them for their failure is something something really disruptive <laughs> yeah and it's 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 hard yeah <laughs> it's been hard for me but they they do once they get it once the senior managers and the executives say look we want you to experiment we want you to try things but don't be stupid be thoughtful uh -huh. work out what you want to learn from this experiment and try things uh -huh. and we just have to keep reinforcing that mm -hmm. that it's okay and actually what mm -hmm. we want to turn that into that actually you're going to get promoted faster, you're going to get better bonus, your career is going to go better if you are seen to experiment and try things. Mm -hmm. And come, talking, when, we, when we talk about innovation in banking, or rather fin technology, finance technology, um, when, I was in, when I was studying abroad, there was, there's a service called Mondo, this is in the UK, yeah. and then some, it sounds so cool, it's kind of hip, uh, kind of new thing, and but it allows new kind of banking uh, thrive in digital world. Uh, and this is not uh, what I call cryptocurrency, far from it, uh, or maybe which I don't know, they might <laughs> it might be a similar thing. Uh, which, but 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 the kind of the kind of uh, uh, innovation, why I cannot see it from in this part of the world. 
Um, there are a number of reasons. I mean, Mondo certainly doing you know a, a great job in 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 Europe, and there's a lot of noise about you know London's the fintech capital of the planet. Bless them, um, but they never were. Yeah, China is is the capital of fintech. It ah, always has been. Interesting. Yeah, I'm gonna. Uh, you have to keep that for a while while we're going okay. for our second break. Don't go away. Well, thriving innovation is a challenge. Getting our people to come on board is another challenge. Well, uh, we have here uh, Neil Cross. He's the Chief Innovation Officer from DBS uh, Singapore, DBS Bank Singapore, which was uh, which were um, it were they've got this uh, award from Euro Money as the world's best digital brand. And congratulations, Neil. And you were wow. also the world's most disruptive CIO, CTO, uh, awarded by Sir Richard Branson and Steve Wozniak. So there's a lot of things we have learned from you in the last two uh, chapters of this interview. Uh, we're now in our last chapter now. Um, it's about, we thought that, I thought that London was the chapter w w the capital of fintech in the world but you corrected me it's china that's right always has been and why china if china can do it so as malaysia yeah well that's right there's no there's you know there's no reason why any country can't be a significant fintech hub mm. um you know china have some advantage mm. they have regulators who have, um, and sometimes, you know, regulate is the best job they can do, mm. is to do nothing, at least in the beginning. So uh, L that's why London was successful. The regulators didn't step in and stop FinTech as soon as they started. Mm -hmm. And the same in China, they give them time to grow. Regulators, you know, are, are dual-sided. So on one side, obviously, they don't want anything bad. They always look after the customer. That's their mm. job, and rightly so. Mm. But on the other side, the other half of their job is to develop a robust financial ecosystem. Mm. And so they want different players in the market and they let them grow and you know we're now in the world where in China 33% mm. of all insurance is bought through a fintech. 52% of all payments by volume in China is on fintech. Just Online. let you sink that in. Mm. Yeah. So that's the other 48% is like credit cards, cash, etc. Mm. And 25% are wealth. They do have a large population and they leapfrogged. So you had people who didn't have bank accounts suddenly leapfrog, which is what we've seen in India as well, mm. a, a growing fintech capital um, into that. Mm. Now, Singapore recently, I did a lot, of, we've done a lot of work with them over the years. They're positioning themselves very much as the fintech of Southeast Asia, you know, done a great job. But Malaysia has more people. Mm. And so a lot of fintech is consumer based. So, like you said with Mondo, it's mm. to individual people mm. and, you know, they want to try, they want a new experience that adds value. And also an experience which is cheaper and easier to use, mm -hmm. which, which historically financial services hasn't mm. fallen into that. Mm. Um, so there's, there's no reason why uh, Malaysia couldn't be a fintech capital as well. Obviously, mm. there needs some alignment between the different government departments. They mm. need alignment with private sector. We need mm. to bring in more venture capital, and, and mm -hmm. you know. But I've, um, I'll be up here, um, certainly helping a, a number of government departments. Mm. Uh, MDEX, one of them, um, and obviously Kazana as well, mm. and and give you know my kind of thoughts on how we could achieve that. There's some amazing technical talent in Malaysia. I think I don't know are you guys keeping it secret up here for a reason. <laughs> Because uh, I don't think the rest we of the world. Go, we always keep it things hush hush yeah. sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's a, it's a well kept, you know, it's a well kept secret. Um, mm. and, and and so for me, it's about ambition. You know, does Malaysia really want to be a mm. fintech capital? And mm. if so, you know, it's money, it's effort, it's mm. it's alignment mm. to to make that a reality. Mm. But you are going to see more fintech and you know there's a lot of banks here mm. CIMB is a great example where they're partnering mm. a lot more with fintech mm. so that's the first stage is that mm. actually banks are starting to realize hey our cu we should give our customers a better experience mm. now historically as finance organizations we haven't done that 
So why don't we partner with some of these new entrants? And I think that's the best model. The bank, you've got the safety and security and scale of a bank, mm -hmm. and, and then you've got the kind of agility and edginess and, and you know, simplicity of mm -hmm. a fintech. Mm -hmm. And that partnership only makes the lives of customers so, much better. So, so, would that be in the form of new setup or? Um, it tends to be, you know, the, the, the bank works with existing fintechs. I mean, with a startup, you can't work with a startup who's on a first phase build, obviously, because it's finance. You need this thing to be scalable and security never compromise on security, uh, finance organizations. Um, but it'd be nice to see more homegrown Malaysian fintech. But to do that, you need, like Singapore did, they imported a lot of foreign fintech, got them to headquarter there, and then those foreign fintech started to educate more of the local community, then the local community started to build their own fintech. Mm. And then you start to see people leaving banks mm. and then setting up their own fintech companies mm. as well. Mm. Um, so it isn't so much about, you know, is Malaysia good at fintech or not? Mm. It's just a timeline thing. Mm. Yeah, and maybe now is the time that Malaysia starts to really ramp up its fintech journey. Mm. And historically, actually, I've been impressed with some of the innovation coming out of Malaysian banks. Mm. Um, I've been, you know, coming up to Malaysia, what, for 10 years mm. um, in, in previous roles and in my current role. Um, and so you have all the components. I think it just needs a bit more alignment mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. some, a big push and, um, and some media and PR from people like you as well. Well, we can help, of course. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, we have a few more minutes. Um, yeah. How about talent? Um, you, you say you, were, you, you are now working with universities because you're kind of frustrated with the kind of uh, systems that we, uh, that we they have there. Yeah. Uh, what can we expect from the university? What should we expect from the university in the next, let's say, five years? What I want to see, I mean, I'm very much, so I left school at, um, well, I left school, just turned 16. I don't have any formal qualifications, mm. um, but I seem to have done quite well. Um, and, and my point is that I think universities need to partner more with businesses to, for their students to get real world experience, mm. yeah? I think it's great to learn the knowledge, but also I want to see more courses um, where students are, are doing real life scenarios. So encouraging students and actually having a course where they can learn how to be a startup entrepreneur. Mm, mm -hmm. you know, and also mm, learn mm. The, the, the skills mm. in business. Why? Exactly, the skill sets. Yeah, yeah. the skill sets. How do, I mean, a really important skill which I see lacking coming out of students is ability to influence. Mm. And so, you know, a lot of my job in, in the world of corporate and many people's jobs in corporate is being able to influence other people inside the organization to work with you on a certain project. And that involves being able to analyze data and numbers. You can talk about how much the thing's going to make, this initiative, you know, it's how, do, how do you do a sales pitch? You know, how do you, um, um, how do you kind of, you know, build a prototype? But guess what? Those cor corporate skills are the same for startups. Mm. And so if universities start to, and schools start to mandate, actually we need this entrepreneurial skills training, mm. then at the end, when they leave the you know, education system, they can go two ways. They can go into a corporate and be way more effective at influence and have a successful career, mm. or they can go into the world of startup and hopefully mm. fintech and be mm. more successful in that space as well. well. Thank you very much, Neil Cross, for your insight. Uh, and uh, that's all for tonight. We were talking about uh, what would happen to me if, let's say, one day robots will replace me on the screen, huh? <laughs> uh, but I'm very optimistic. Uh, I'm leaving, we're leaving you on the, on the optimistic note. Uh, thank you very much again, uh, Nick Cross, the Chief Innovation Officer of DBS Bank from Singapore. And uh, you might have, you know, your own comments. Uh, you can share with us um, on our social media. Uh, platforms, Facebook, we are on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Good night. Bye-bye.